Hello all, uh, I hope you can hear me and at least see the slides up on the screen. Uh, this is the strangest talk I've ever given, but uh, <laughs> under the circumstances, it's about the only one I can give today. Um, let me give you a good idea of why I'm not in Jacksonville right now. This is what happened to our house last week in uh, Hurricane Sandy. Uh, I had hoped to get away despite that. Uh, this is this morning. It looks sort of at first glance like a Christmas card until you notice how that tree is leaning over with the six inches of snow. Uh, what's keeping it up and has been all night is a power wire at the uh, upper right. And um, life is interesting. However, certain practitioners are probably out there this minute doing and using their mathematical modeling techniques, but I want to talk about the uh, classroom side. Uh, anybody has the overwhelming uh, temptation to take careful notes, I don't recommend it. I think it's a lot easier if you simply uh, go to my website uh, and download it. You're more than welcome to use it to share with others, uh, your colleagues, your uh, administrators, or whoever. And contact me by email if you have any questions or want any follow-up. Let's talk about courses at the college algebra and pre-calculus level, but it also has strong implications for developmental algebra courses. Each year, more than a million students take college algebra and pre-calculus. The focus in most of these courses is on preparing the students to go on to mainstream calculus. But in reality, only a very small percentage of these students ever go on to start calculus. It's not easy to get much information, but based on several studies of enro enrollment flows, some interesting things emerge. Currently, on the order of 5% of the students who start, let me emphasize that word, start college algebra, ever go on to start calculus one. The numbers are a trifle higher in the two-year colleges. My guess is because students tend to be a little older, a little more mature and motivated, and you probably have a higher percentage of full-time faculty teaching the course. Despite all of that, the typical DFW rate in college algebra is typically well above 50%. 90% is not unheard of. Virtually none of the students who pass college algebra ever go on to start calculus three. And perhaps on the order of 30 to 40% of the students who pass pre-calculus go on to start calculus one. The provost of one of the largest two-year colleges in the country not too long ago singled out their college algebra course as the one course that by far is most responsible for the school losing students each year. This is a place where the DFW rate in those courses is at the 90% level. But it's not just in the colleges. In San Antonio, the Mayor's Economic Development Council a couple of years ago identified college algebra as one of the major impediments to the city developing the kind of technologically sophisticated workforce that it needs in order to be, to maintain itself and to grow within the techno technology center. As a result, the mayor appointed a special task force that includes representatives from all 11 colleges in the city, plus people from business, industry, and government with the charge that they have to change the focus of the college algebra courses to make those courses more responsive to the needs of the city, the students, and the local industry. I don't like the idea of our being told what our courses have to be, especially by people from outside the colleges, outside of academia. But then why do so many students over a million a year take these courses? Are these students well served by standard college algebra courses? I think not, as you will see. And if they're not well served, what kind of mathematics do these students really need? Those are some very deep questions. Well, part of it is, as we give these courses, that they're focused on getting students to, cal to calculate. 
And at many colleges, calculus is treated as a holy grail. It's the ultimate goal for virtually all students, even though we know that only a minuscule number get there. Much the same can be said about many of the high school programs. They're designed to prepare and lead students toward calculus. I'm reminded, though, of a scene from the third Indiana Jones movie. Remember the night whose sole purpose through the centuries was to protect the Holy Grail from everyone? Do we as mathematicians want to play that same role, fending off the unwashed? I don't think so. But calculus itself is under pressure. Fewer than 500,000 students take calculus in college, a number that at best has held steady over the last 20 years. If anything, I think the number has dropped slightly. On the other hand, on the order of a million students take calculus in high school each year, a number that's been growing at the rate of better than 6% a year. We have twice as many students taking calculus in high school. Calculus is quickly becoming a high school offering, not a college offering. And as a result, we can foresee, not too distantly, the day when college calculus becomes the next developmental offering. But let's look for another moment at high school enrollment flows. Historically, about 50% of students who successfully complete any course in high school went on to the next course. However, over the last 15 years, the continuation rate from introductory to intermediate algebra has increased dramatically to about 85% rather than 50%, largely due to implementation of NCTM-inspired courses and curricula. While high school students are taking far more math, our developmental enrollment has been increasing at an alarming rate. There's a huge disconnect there. Why are more students coming out of high school, having had more math, having to take remedial and developmental courses. Well, my feeling is that developmental programs and traditional algebra-oriented courses in college are a great abyss into which millions of students are pushed each year, an abyss in which vanishing few of them ever manage to climb out. And I suspect in many cases it's the placement exams, particularly the national exams, that are designed to push kids into the traditional algebra development courses. It's a, it's a the reality is we are offering the wrong courses to the wrong students for the wrong reason. What do our students really need? The reality is that virtually none of the students we face in these courses today or in the future will become math or STEM majors. They take these courses to fulfill gen ed requirements, especially at the universities, or requirements from other disciplines. What then do the other disciplines really want their students to learn and bring out of our math classes? To find this out, the MIA Crafty Committee, that's the Committee on Curriculum uh, Reform across the first two years, has held a series of workshops with leading educators from about 23 quantitative disciplines to discuss among themselves and then to report to the math community on the current mathematical needs of each discipline. The results of these sessions have been summarized in a pair of MAA reports volumes that make very, very interesting and intriguing reading. Let me give you a bit of a feel for some of the things that came out of it, recommendations from a few of the disciplines. And keep in mind what they are saying about our courses. Common threads that came through from virtually all of the disciplines is that conceptual understanding rather than rote manipulation is important. They see a need for realistic applications via mathematical modeling that reflect the way mathematics is used in other disciplines and on the job. Statistical reasoning is the primary mathematical topic needed for almost every other discipline. There should be strong emphasis, they recommend, on data and data analysis. And finally, they recommend the use of technology on a routine basis, though typically their routine technology is Excel, not graphing calculators. Other than math, 
Nobody else has a heavy focus on graphing calculators. But some of the specific comments are well worth here. The physicists, who one would expect to be the most mathematically demanding, they certainly are when we talk to them, said, students need conceptual understanding first and some comfort in using basic skills. Then a deeper approach and more sophisticated skills become meaningful. Conceptual understanding is more important than computational skill. And computational skill with a theoretical understanding is shallow. The biologists, extremely fast-growing client discipline of ours, said, the sciences are increasingly seeing students who are quantitatively ill-prepared. The biological sciences represent the largest science client of mathematics education. That's an interesting point. I also view it as a veiled threat. And the current mathematics curriculum for biology majors does not provide biology students with appropriate quantitative skills. They go on from that, and I don't know why the color keeps changing on the slide. Mathematics provides a language for the development and expression of biological concepts and theory. It allows biologists to summarize data, to describe it in logical terms, to draw inferences, and to make predictions. Statistics, modeling, and graphical representation should take priority over calculus. Interesting. And students need descriptive statistics, regression analysis, both the various analysis, probability distribution, Simulation, significance, and error analysis. That's an awful lot of statistics. It's probably more than we would give in an introductory course these days. All of the disciplines indicated various skills, they, skill sets they were looking for. There's a lot of similarity. Uh, among the ones the biologists pointed out, the meaning and use of variables, parameters, functions, and relations. They want the student to be able to formulate linear, exponential, and logarithmic, logarithmic functions from data or from general principles. They should understand the periodic nature of the sine and cosine and the graphical representation of data in a variety of formats, histograms, scatter plots, log-log graphs, which are used for power functions, and semi-log graphs, which are used for exponential and log functions. Business faculty, we're going back to the black. Courses should stress problem solving with the incumbent recognition of ambiguities. Courses should stress conceptual understanding. Motivating the math with the why, not just the hows. Courses should stress critical thinking. An important student outcome is their ability to develop appropriate models to, de to solve defined problems. You hear these same words over and over, the concepts, the data, the statistics, critical thinking. You don't hear anybody saying they need better algebraic skills. However, if one goes beyond the words and has discussions with faculty, particularly from the lab sciences, about what they're talking about what their precise needs are and where the mathematics arises in their courses. It becomes clear that most courses for the non-majors in the other fields, and even courses for majors in most scientific areas, use very little mathematics in class. The mathematics that arises is almost exclusively in the context of the lab where the students have to analyze the weekly experimental data. And it is then that their weak mathematical skills become dramatically evident. When you talk to people in the social sciences, a very similar pattern emerges. They don't have lab data, but they do use statistical reasoning and statistical methods very, very heavily. And most of the math deals with working with interpreting data that students find often on the web or published reports. And again, that's where their weak mathematics shows up. These have some very important implications for algebra level courses. Very few of the students we see really need a skills-oriented course. 
if they haven't gotten it in high school, it's going to be too late. There are going to be too few that we can harvest and talk into going further in math programs to be worth the cost to all the other students. What almost every one of the students we see needs is a course that is modeling based, one that emphasizes realistic applications that mirror what they will see and do in their other courses, one that emphasizes conceptual understanding, and I'll talk about what that means in a couple of minutes, an approach that emphasizes data and its uses, including both fitting functions to data as well as more traditional statistical methods and reason. They need courses that better motivate them to succeed in general and that better prepare them for other courses. If all we do is focus on developing routine manipulative skills without developing conceptual understanding, I've said this before and if you've heard it from me before, I apologize, but I think it's worth hearing again. All we're going to produce are students who are no more than imperfect organic clones of the PI-89 calculator. And it is not fair to those students to be spending the kind of money and the kind of time for a two or a four year degree and come out of it with nothing more than what a $130 piece of machinery can do. This is an article that appeared in the opinion page of the New York Times Sunday Magazine over the summer. It's written by a sociology professor who asks the question, is algebra necessary? It is an article that I think everyone in the mathematics community needs to read for a number of reasons. In this lead paragraph, and it's a long article, I was in, uh, I think in July, that it appeared. He says, in both high school and college, there are millions of students daily who expect to fail these courses. Well, but why are they subjected to this ordeal? And he finds himself moving toward a view that we shouldn't subject them to this ordeal. And he goes on to discuss in detail why a traditional algebra course has very little to offer to the overwhelming majority of the students, certainly that the social scientists see. When you Google the article, you will find that there are many reports of, of you know, where people are talking about this article having generated a national discussion. Well, I'm not sure there's been a lot of national discussion about this in mathematics. I think the discussion is raging outside of math for the most part, although apparently Lynn Steen is writing an article on this for the next issue of the MAA's focus, which should be out any day now. It might be worth looking at that. But picture that provost I mentioned a few minutes ago, looking at 90% DFW rates in college algebra, and suddenly seeing this theme that the social sciences and other areas don't really think that algebra course is important or necessary. What do you think is going to happen? I think what's going to happen is that there are going to be a tremendous number of places where the departmental requirements for our courses and even the gen ed requirements are going to start dropping. What will your department do if half of its sections are lost because the requirements that force students in there no longer apply? Does anybody seriously think that you can have the re requirements reinstated once they are dropped if you then change the focus in the courses to what the other people today want? It's going to be too late. I think it's essential that we in mathematics become very proactive in changing the focus of our courses before extremely unpleasant things happen from external sides. What do our students really need? I think a focus on mathematical modeling produces the right courses for the right students for the right reasons. And let's see what this involves. 
You can't do mathematical modeling without a very strong simultaneous emphasis on conceptual understanding. The two are hand in glove. You can't do one without the other. But what does conceptual understanding really mean? How do you recognize its presence or its absence? How do you encourage its development? How do you assess whether students have developed conceptual understanding? Or are you beating your head against the wall when you try? Well, let me give you one experience. Uh, my wife, the Parsman, tried an experiment a few years back where they gave a set, half of their college algebra trig courses were given a traditional algebra-focused approach. The other was a reform approach where the emphasis was on conceptual understanding and math modeling. There were 10 common questions on the, com on the final exams for the two groups. Uh, it turned out that in order to be fair to the students in the traditional algebra course, almost all the commonality had to be traditional algebra. It wasn't felt that they could handle non-traditional problems. The fact that they weren't emphasized for the uh, students in the modeling class didn't seem to be a factor. This was one of them, very simple problem. You're given enrollment figures at a college in two years. They're asked to create a linear function, answer a question or two. The line there that I've highlighted in yellow explain using an English sentence the meaning of the slope. The faculty had no doubt that their students could handle that, even though it wasn't the focus in their course. Here are some of the response. This is actually the set of all the responses in the traditional course. I'm on several screens, but if you look at a few of them, if you read them carefully, most of them could probably be described as gibberish. A fair number of the students basically took an equation and put it into words. A goodly percentage of them basically left it out because they had absolutely no idea what the slope meant in words. Let's go toward the end there. The slope is the increase of students per year, it's sort of there, very, very roughly. How many times a year it increases? In the modeling classes, there's a very different pattern. Virtually every one of these statements is a complete sentence. More importantly, virtually every one of them is a meaningful mathematical statement. Both groups had the comparable ability to calculate the slope of a line. Mind you, in both groups, there were a couple of students who used delta x over delta y instead. Uh, you can't get away from that, I guess. But I personally think that it's far more important that students understand what the slope of a line means in a context. Wherever that context arises, whether it's in a math class, in a class and other disciplines, or eventually on a job. And I can assure you from my discussions with people in other disciplines, they have to know that. This comes up incredibly often in other fields. But unless explicit attention is devoted to emphasizing the conceptual understanding of what the slope means, most students are not able to create viable interpretations on their own. And without that interpretation and understanding, they likely won't be able to apply the mathematics to realistic situations. We're having them jump through hoops and do exercises by the score, but it's not taking and it's not transferable. And if students can't make these connections on their own with a concept as simple as the slope of a line, they're certainly not going to be able to create meaningful interpretations and connections of more sophisticated mathematical concepts. For example, what is the slope, what is the significance of the base of an exponential function? What does the power in a power function represent? What do the parameters in a sinusoidal model represent? 
What are the factors of a polynomial mean? What's the significance of the derivative or the definite integral? Unless we pay very clear attention to focusing on these things, our students are not going to be able to get anything useful out of our courses. But the issue of statistics presents us with a very important challenge. In many ways, the two-year colleges are in a much better position to deal with that challenge than most universities and many four-year schools. Almost all the universities have a department of statistics, and no other, nobody else on campus, especially the math department, is allowed to touch statistics. At many two-year schools, statistics is a bread and butter offering. But our students need lots and lots of statistics. And we have to emphasize that more. It's not just a matter of a single course. I think a more intelligent solution is to, in addition to that course, integrate the statistical ideas and methods into math courses at all levels. Many of you, I'm sure, have heard of the Common Core curriculum. This is a curriculum that, as the last I heard, has been officially adopted by at least 45 states and a number of territories. It's the closest thing we have to a national mathematics curriculum. The Common Core curriculum recognizes the importance of statistics, and it calls for introducing students to statistical ideas and methods starting in the sixth grade. And I'm not talking about just means, medians, and modes. By the end of 12th grade, every student is expected to have seen the equivalent of a very solid introductory statistics course, probably considerably more material than is in most of our college courses today. And certainly, much of it is going to be offered to the students in high school at a considerably more sophisticated level than is usually done in most of our current courses. The likelihood is that most programs based on the Common Core will introduce statistics via independent units that are not connected to other to the algebra-oriented topics that make up the bulk of the curriculum. But I personally feel, and I do some of this, that it's much more effective if statistical ideas are integrated as natural applications of algebraic concepts and methods. This works very, very nicely for a number of reasons. But rather than getting into some of those details, let's step back a little bit. Students see the equation of a line in pre-algebra class in high school or junior high school. They see it in elementary algebra, in intermediate algebra, in college algebra, and pre-calculus courses. Yet how many of the students you have still have trouble finding the equation of the tangent line when they're in calculus one? In contrast, students are lucky to have one semester of calculus where they see this huge collection of topics. You know, different method, different technique, different idea every day. The ideas are much more complex than algebra. They're far more varied. They're highly, very counterintuitive. But after that one semester exposure, the students are expected to understand and use a wide variety of the statistical techniques and ideas in all their other courses. It seems very unreasonable to me. Another problem I think that gives our students trouble, especially when they face mathematics in other departments, is that we do everything with X and Y. Every other field uses the whole spectrum of alphabet, A to Z, alpha through omega, whatever else. Think of Newton's second law of motion in the form Y equals MX or Einstein's formula, y equals c squared x, or the ideal gas law, y z equals n r x. Students who see only x's and y's in their math classes don't connect this to anything else. They can't apply the techniques we've taught them, hopefully, 
when other letters arise in other disciplines. And even if your textbook has a few problems at the end, the first 60 of them are X's and Y's. The ones at the end are the zingers for the most part in students' minds. They're not the real ones. We're not getting them to connect our mathematics to everyone else's. Very good example of this is Kepler's third law that expresses the relationship between the average distance of a planet from the sun and the length of its year. If I write it as y squared equals 0.1664x cubed, tell me which variable represents which quantity. There's no hint. If you write it the way it would be written in a physics course, t squared equals 0.1664d to the third, a huge conceptual hurdle has been eliminated. That's why the other disciplines talk about are being too rigorous, not because we do theorems and proofs, but because our problem sets are all context-free. But enough of generalities. Let me show you a variety of examples and problems that I've used that illustrate a lot of these ideas. First topic I would do in, say, a college algebra course is to introduce students briefly to data and statistical measures. For example, here is a table and a histogram showing the monthly historical rainfall in Orlando. If you think about it, both the table and the chart are examples of a function. Most of our students, I'd say all of our students, have seen the idea of a function before. When we repeat it in the same fashion, it doesn't penetrate. Hit them from a totally different point of view with something that makes sense to them, it changes the whole dynamic. Or, here's a table of data on the average worldwide temperature in degrees Celsius in various years. And some of the questions I would ask the students to do is to decide which is the independent and which is the dependent variable. They find that hard. What are appropriate scales for the two variables if you were to create a scatter plot, which basically is a question about the domain and range? What letters would you use? And what are some predictive questions that are natural that you would like to answer? Next topic I would get into is the behavior of functions, tables and graphs especially. Talking about things like whether the function is increasing, decreasing, what the turning point are, is it concave up or down, what are its inflection points? I'm talking about algebra, not a calculus course. No derivatives, but just descriptive ideas of what these things mean. For example, here's a graph that shows the profit from an investment over time. When is it a gain? When, it, when do you have a loss? When is it increasing or decreasing? When is it concave up or down? Where are the turning points? Estimate the inflection points. Students at this level easily take these ideas. They make sense to them and they can see the questions as being useful or I can give a table of values and ask them to estimate where the inflection points are. That's not too trivial. I think your calculus students would have a challenge with that. Third topic, I would look at linear functions, emphasizing the meaning of the parameters and the idea of fitting a, function, a linear function to the data. Hold on, I went too far. The snowy tree cricket, which lives up in the Colorado Rockies, could also be living here on Long Island today, <laughs> has a chirp rate which is related to the temperature. One of the things I guess field biologists do is send their graduate students out to collect data on interesting topics. Can you find a linear function that fits this? What's the meaning of the slope and the vertical intercept? What are practical values for the domain and range? Some predictive questions. Some of you are probably looking at this and saying, that's just too good to be true. I don't believe it. I don't either, to be honest. But apparently this is in the Encyclopedia Britannica.
Here's some information on the chirp rate of the striped ground cricket, which is a more mathematically challenged cousin of the uh, snowy tree cricket. It doesn't quite seem to have figured out just how to uh, get itself to chirp in a perfectly linear manner. That's an interesting challenge there to draw a line that captures the trend in all of the data points. Find its equation and be able to use it. I've seen mathematicians struggling with this. Also I've seen students struggling with it. Admittedly, all the graphing calculators will do this at the push of a button. Certainly Excel and other sophisticated packages will do it for you or them, but if you don't do something like this by hand, you don't really appreciate what the technology is doing for you or what its value is. The regression line is defined as the line that comes closest to all of the data points in the least square sense, which means that the sum of the squares of the vertical deviations is a minimum. Basically, the, the calc 3 example or problem uh, to find the minimum of a function of two variables it can be done algebraically, I have, but I wouldn't recommend doing that in class. But this is a concept that the students really pick up on. And if the technology is then used in an exploratory way, it really becomes a, a game and a challenge for them to try to find parameter values that minimize or get the, some of the squares as small as possible. Next topic, nonlinear functions, particularly exponential growth and decay, power functions, logarithmic functions, and data systems. After linear functions, the most common and useful families of functions are in order. In my view, and I think most practitioners would agree, exponential functions power functions, logarithmic functions, sinusoidal functions, and down in fifth place, and perhaps I would push it further down, because I think the normal function is a lot more important in practice, a polynomial. In traditional math courses, however, the major emphasis is on polynomials, because they provide so many wonderful opportunities to practice algebraic skills. Nobody ever wonders what those skills are good for in the long run, but the practice is considered important. Well, picture boot camp for the Marine Corps. Push-ups are also important. I don't know where they lead. When you have a linear function y equals ax plus b, successive differences for fixed x spacing are all constants. That constant difference is related to the slope of the line. If the spaces and the x's is one unit, it is exactly the slope. When you have an exponential function of the form y equals a times b to the x, the successive ratios are constant. When that constant ratio is greater than one, you have an exponential growth function, and the base is a growth factor. When the ratio of successive values is less than one, you have exponential decay and you have a decay factor. Typical kind of exponential problem here for growth. In two years, different amounts of, in this case, number of billions of metric tons of carbon dioxide were emitted into the atmosphere in the US. Write an exponential function to model it and predict it at some point into the future. Not too far into the future because you can't extrapolate too far. And that's an important lesson students need to know. And that limitation on extrapolation means you've got to address in every single problem the meaning of the domain and the range. It's not just avoid the places where you divide by zero or take the square root of a negative number. Every realistic problem is limited to some finite domain and range. Another lovely example that my students all manage to relate to is the idea of modeling drug levels in the blood. 
Anything you take, any medication or drug is washed out of the bloodstream, usually through the kidney, but each drug is washed out at a different rate that's characteristic of that drug. For example, in any 24-hour period, about 25% of any Prozac in the blood is washed out, leaving 75%. In every class I've used this, there are always students who either themselves or probably or they talk about somebody they know takes Prozac. It's common. If it's not Prozac, it's anything else. No, think of steroids. Let's model it. If we start with initial amount D0 of 80 milligrams, after one day or 24 hours, 25% of that is removed, leaving D1, which is 0.75 of D0. Turns out to be 60 milligrams, but don't worry about the numbers yet. After a second day, 25% of D1 is removed, leaving D2. 0.75 of D1, or 0.75 or 0.75 D0, or 0.75 squared times D0. After a third day, the level of the drug works out to be 0.75 to the third times D0. And in general, after N days, the amount of Prozac left is 0.75 to the N times the starting value D0. This is how I introduce an exponential decay function. The base here is 0.75. It's less than 1. We have exponential decay. Typical kinds of questions, what will be the level of Prozac after seven days or 10 days? How long will it take until the level of Prozac is down to 10 milligrams? In order to answer that algebraically, you have to solve 80 times 0.75 to the n equals 10. That requires the use of logs. I, am, I tend to downplay in my remarks the value of manipulative skills. But certain manipulative skills are incredibly important, and they come up repeatedly, not just one day. Or a person smokes a cigarette. A certain amount of nicotine is absorbed into the blood. Every hour, a certain percentage is washed out. Same kind of mathematics, just a different drug, different situation. Or you can have data that falls into a pattern that is reasonable to think is exponential. Here's data on the worldwide amount of wind power generating capacity in megawatts in various years. Students can be asked to find the equation of such a function using a calculator, interpret the values of the parameters, and talk about domain and range issues, and use them to answer predictive questions. And again, if you look at the highlighted things here, the numbers are not you know, exponential function of 3 times 2 to the x equals whatever, 24, or something that will work out evenly. They're working with much more sophisticated numbers and equations. But they don't complain. And for the most part, they master it. Or another example from biology. Biologists have observed that the larger the area of a habitat, the more species that live there. And the best relationship for this type of thing is a power function. Here's some data on the number of species and the area of various islands in the Caribbean. The pattern suggests, because an island with zero area will be home to zero species, a power function. Or, the biologists have observed a lot of things over the years. Uh, flying speeds of animals seems to be related to their overall body length. And again, a power function is the model of choice. All right, I'm sure you've all been sitting there waiting for polynomials. But I'm not going to show you anything about factoring polynomials, more or less. Here's some data on the, over the first eight, well, dozen, 15 years or so of the AIDS epidemic, the cumulative total number of cases reported in the United States. 
when you look at the data, it certainly looks non-linear. For most of that time period, it was believed that an exponential function would be a good choice. That's the best exponential fit. Uh, correlation coefficient of 0.9176 certainly suggests a high level of correlation or good fit. The sum of the squares of the fit, which measures how well the function fits the data, is like two and two thirds million. But more importantly, your eyes tell you that it's not a lousy fit. It's an easy judgment call. Well, what else could you do? Well, you can see turning points and the like. You might be tempted to think, could it be a polynomial pattern? Well, let's look at a cubic polynomial to fit the same data. To the eye, it looks like an extraordinarily good fit. The sum of the squares is less than 3,500, not 2.6 or 7 million. Of course, I did mention a few minutes back that domain and range issues come up all the time. How far can this domain be extended? You go a little further into the future and the fu function doesn't look legitimate. What's its uh, leading coefficient, by the way? The concepts are important. Periodic behavior from the point of view of the sine and the cosine. I have only a couple of minutes, so let me be fairly fast. Here's a function that I created very quickly to give the number of hours of daylight on any day of the year, January 1st is t equals 1 and so on, here in Jacksonville. In fact, I would walk into class, put this on the board, and ask my students to tell me what the different numbers represent in a practical way. Each of those parameters has a very distinct meaning. Here is a chart you can get on weather.com for any location, this is also Jacksonville, that shows historic high and low temperatures each month. You can also get precipitation. Here's another chart you can get online easily that shows a 48 hour period with the tide cycles. Each of these things is a periodic or an almost periodic phenomenon. Each of them can be modeled with a sinusoidal function, either a sine or a cosine. To do it, you have to understand what those parameters mean. You have to understand them very deeply. But given any of these displays, I would have no hesitation asking my students to estimate the period estimate the maximum, the minimum, and therefore find the midline. So I probably wouldn't ask them to find the maximum, minimum. I would say, what's the midline? Estimate the amplitude. What's the frequency? Estimate the phase shift for a cosine or a sine. Another thing I have my students do, here's data on average daytime high temperatures in a particular place on every two weeks. Create a mathematical model sinusoidal function that fits it. These are challenging problems, intellectually challenging. But the students can do it, and they understand it. Types of problems I would give on an exam in addition to data problems. Given average daytime high temperature somewhere ranges from a low to a high, and tell them uh, the coldest and the hottest they are, Sketch the graph over several years so they can demonstrate the periodicity, write a formula, find domain and range, tell me what the parameters are, do some predictions. For more details, including expanded, I didn't use everything, I had to chop a lot out to fit, but please feel free to download this from my website or contact me directly for any more information. But let me go back to what I titled this presentation. I think very seriously that mathematical modeling is the right approach to give the right courses to the right students for the right reasons. And that's what we're paid to do. That's our commitment. And that's what I hope all of us would do. Thank you very much.
and enjoy your stay in uh, sunny Florida. And uh, if anybody wants a shovel-ready job, my front driveway is waiting. Thank you again. And again, I, well, not again, but I really want to thank both Sandy uh, and Kevin for all they've done to make this possible. This has really been a, something done on the fly and uh, really is a testament to their willingness to put themselves out tremendously. I really thank them and please give them a tremendous uh, round of applause. Thank you all.